Today, we're going to talk about the rapture. Now, when you hear the, hear the word rapture, a lot of people, even a lot of non-Christians, have heard that word. And maybe they know what it means, or they think they know what it means. But I, I'm, I've kind of found uh, over the years that a lot of people have heard that term, and they know that it's like all of a sudden people disappear. But that's about all they know. And it's like, is that even biblical? Is that even something that's really going to happen? We're going to talk about the rapture today because a lot of people don't know a lot about it. And there's some um, teaching out there on, on, the, on YouTube that actually isn't very biblical about that. Um, there's, a, oh, I, I suppose about 10 years ago, uh, a guy wrote a book called Raptureless, and uh, he's supposedly a Bible teacher, but he's supposedly teaching that there's no such thing as the rapture in the Bible. And I'm like, so I had to get his book just to read, like, where are you coming up with that? Because when I read the Bible, it's, it's there. Uh, and so I read his book, and like a lot of books, um, if, you have a, if you have a preconceived notion, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say, if you take things out of context. You have to put things in context in the Bible. In other words, you have to look at the big picture at, before you can look at the, at the smaller picture. And, and so like a lot of authors who kind of get off course a little bit, they're not looking at the whole context of the Bible or they're leaving out other verses that clearly are, are, are contradictory to what they're saying. So we're going to take a, a real biblical look at this today. So I'm, I'm going to use maybe a few more scriptures out of the Bible that I would normally use because I want you to understand this is not just my opinion. Um, it's my opinion, but based on what I see as biblical fact. And so uh, we're going to look at that today. So what is the rapture? And what does the Bible say about it? Well, actually, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. The concept is totally in the Bible, but the word rapture is not in the Bible. And that's maybe why uh, there's not a lot of teaching on it. Maybe that's why people get wrong ideas about it, because that word is not there, but the concept is totally in the Bible. Um, the word rapture, as we talk about it in Christian circles, comes from the Greek word harpazo. Now, the New Testament was originally written in the Greek language. So if you want to understand, um, maybe get a better understanding of the New Testament, it's good, it's good if you're really uh, fluent in Greek, ancient Greek, right? I'm not, but I have a really good computer <laughs> that helps me with that. And, and so that's where I, I study a lot of Greek and, and Hebrew. But the Greek word uh, harpazo in Latin is rapturo, rapturo. That's where we get our word rapture. So harpazo literally means to be snatched up, to be caught up. Um, it's, it occurs, that, that word harpazo, occurs 14 times in the New Testament. So it's, uh, for example, when Philip is, is walking along um, and talking to the, to the uh, eunuch and he leads him to Christ and baptizes him, the next thing he knows, he's in like in a whole different place. And it says he was... Uh, I don't know what the words what it used, snatched up or whatever, but that word is harpazo. So it's there several times. John was taken into heaven to see things in the future, and that's where he how what the book of Revelation came from. And so uh, when it talks about John being caught up into heaven so God could show him the future, that word harpazo, or the Greek word rapturo, is is what that that word is there. So it's it's totally there. It means to be, again, it means to be snatched up, to, actually even to be carried off by force. It's not like, hey, I want to go up, watch me fly. It's like, no, there's another force like snatching you out of that. And that's what harpazo means, rapturo, where we get our word rapture, right? So let me read that to you um, <clears throat> out of uh, one of the places where we get this concept of the rapture, it's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together. There it is, harpazo, caught up. That, those two words, caught up, is the one Greek word, harpazo, to be snatched up, to be carried away by force. There it is right there. So we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so that we will always be with the Lord. All right, it's important to note here, Jesus at this point has not physically come back to earth. The Bible says he's going to do that. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives. Land, you know what I mean? That's where he's going to come to. Anyway, um, but he's physically going to be on the Mount of Olives. And we talked about that last week. But, this, but that hasn't happened yet. At the rapture, when we're caught up, we meet him in the air. He's not back yet. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute when he does come back. But that's what's going on here. Paul talks uh, further about it to the Corinthians. Now, this first scripture he read was to the Thessalonians. There was a church in Thessalonica. So the people that went there were Thessalonians. And they, they, were, they knew from, from the teaching of the apostles that Jesus Christ was coming back. And they thought they'd missed it because there were some false teachers coming through that said, hey, Jesus already came back and you missed him. <laughs> I would have asked, like, well, what about you guys? <laughs> what are you still doing here? Maybe they didn't ask that. I don't know. Um, anyway, they begin to be worried and like, did we miss it? And so Paul, actually, 1 Thessalonians is one of the, they think is probably the first letter that we have in our scriptures that Paul ever wrote. And he was writing to give some encouragement and some, uh, uh, I guess, um, to kind of let the Thess Thessalon Thessalonians know that they didn't miss it and, and, and what would actually happen. But he also uh, talked about it with the Corinthians, the church at Corinth. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 51. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. It's a Reference to what John eventually wrote in um, Revelation, the trumpet judgments. But we're not talking about that today. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forevermore. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Now, I should probably clarify here. When Paul wrote this letter, he was writing to Christians. And so we have to look at the context. People who die with their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, in other words, they're saved, they're born again, or whatever word you want to use there, um, they were the ones that will, if they've already died, they will rise. And we'll learn this in a week or two when we talk about the judgments and all that, the great white throne judgment, judgment day, people who died without Christ, people who died without salvation, they might have been good people, but they didn't have their faith and trust in Jesus. They hadn't accepted him as Lord and Savior. They're not resurrected. That comes later, and we'll talk about that another day. It's just the people who have, the, the believers in Jesus Christ who have died, right? Right? Um, so they'll be raised. If, if we're alive, we don't die, but we're transformed in the twinkling of an eye, in the blinking of an eye, it says in this translation. So we're, we'll, we, we get bodies that will live forever. I suppose if you want hair, you can have hair. I don't know. We'll see. I always thought I wanted my hair back, but now I, I kind of like the windproof Although it's easy to get sunburned without hair on the top of your head. I'm finding that out. I keep forgetting I'm bald. I go outside like, ouch, that hurts. So like, yeah, cover that thing up. Um, anyway, but Jesus even talked about uh, this catching up, this snatching away what, what we would call the rapture. Here's one place he talks about it. Luke 17, starting in verse 35. 
He says, I tell you, and he's talking to believers, he said, on that night, the night when there's this snatching away, uh, it's not going to be night everywhere, because <laughs> it's going to be day somewhere, but on that day, on that night, there'll be two in bed. One will be taken, the other will be left. There'll be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken, the other one will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other will be left. I don't know how, how much more clear you can get about this snatching up, this what we call the rapture. It's clear from what Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It seems pretty clear what Jesus was teaching when you put it all into context. And so when we read those, and then so this is really our main point for today, and, and this is it. The rapture is the imminent event. Remember that word imminent. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. The rapture is the imminent event in which all who have put their trust in Jesus Christ will be suddenly caught up from the earth and taken into heaven by him. So what does it mean that the rapture is imminent? Imminent means, the dictionary meaning is like, it's likely to happen at any moment. It could, could happen at any moment. Um, it's impending. And one thing that um, we need to know about the rapture, especially based on what we've been studying on biblical, bi biblical prophecy, there's nothing more that has to happen prophetically before the rapture. Like, there were some things that had to happen, like the Jews being back in the land, which happened in 1948. But now there is nothing prophetically that must happen before the snatching up of the believers and the resurrection of those who have died in Christ. Nothing has to happen. Now, there are a lot of prophetic events that are still to take place before Jesus returns physically to this earth, but nothing that happens before the rapture. So we say... It's imminent. It's, it, it, could, it could happen any time. There's nothing else that has to happen before the rapture. Um, there was a, an early church father, an early church uh, minister uh, called Augustine. Some people call him Augustine. Augustine. And he said, he said this, I thought it was really good. He said, the last day is hidden so that every day may be regarded. In other words, if we knew the exact day of the, of the rapture, of the snatching up, it's like we would live weirdly, probably, right? And, and so we need to know the season, but we're not going to know the day or the hour. And part of that is so that we'll continue to live um, like we should be living. There are basically four views amongst people who teach the Bible, Christians who teach the Bible, because um, a lot of people teach the Bible who aren't Christians. <laughs> but there are basically four views. And one view I already talked about is that the rapture is not, is not a thing. It's, it's something made up by man. It's not, it, Jesus just comes back and that's it. I was like, yeah, but that's not what the Bible says. So I, I, don't, I don't put any really, I mean, I, 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 I believe that people who are teaching that are still going to go to heaven if they trust in Jesus Christ, right? You don't have to believe in the rapture to be taken in the rapture, okay? You just have to believe in Jesus. So there, that's one view. But then out of the other views, there's what we call, and I'm going to explain this, the pre-trib rapture, a mid-trib rapture, and a post-trib rapture. The word trib is in there, and it's short for tribulation. There's one thing we have not talked about yet, and we can talk about more another day, is that there is going to be a, a, a seven-year period on this earth of great tribulation where the world is just going to be in upheaval. It's the time of the Antichrist, which I think we're going to be talking about next week, more about the tribulation and the Antichrist and what, what his deal is. There's going to be a seven-year period there, and we, we looked at this earlier in one of our earlier messages it's going to be kicked off when the Antichrist makes a seven-year peace agreement um, with, the, with the nation of Israel and its enemies. And we talked about that could be like an agreement to share the Temple Mount so they could rebuild their temple, and that was last week's sermon. But the Antichrist is going to come on the scene looking like he's got a lot of good plans, 
and one of his first plans to be unveiled that's going to give him a lot of notoriety is he's going to make peace. Uh, he's going to be a broker of peace between Israel, the nation of Israel, and the Jewish people, and the Arabs and the, the, and the Muslims, which, as you know, has not there in, in how long have Muslims been around? Since about 600 AD. So however many years, 1400 years, there's not been peace. Actually, Israel has not had a lot of peace for thousands of years, really. Um, but there's going to be peace for three and a half years. And in the middle of that tribulation period, um, it's, it's really going to, uh, well, the Antichrist is going to reveal himself for who he really is. Again, we'll talk about that next week. So we, I want to talk about this tribulation period because that's really important when we talk about the rapture because I believe the Bible gives us, I believe, this is my opinion, my interpretation, really good evidence that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation starts. Now, I know that's going to torque some people off. There's a person who won't come to this church because, we, because I teach pre, pre-tribulation rapture. I'm not going to come if you teach that. I'm just, just reading now the Bible. Sorry. I don't know. Um, but let me talk about the rapture really quick. Just so, or not the rapture, the, the tribulation. This is not really the sermon, but I just want you to understand that it's a thing, all right? So here's the Old Testament, uh, prophet Daniel. Angel is talking to Daniel about the angel Michael and talking about the end times. So this is probably um, 600 B.C., roughly. Daniel 12, verse 1. Uh, so the angel's telling Daniel this. Now at that time, let's talk about the time of the Antichrist, the end times. Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. So the angel is telling Daniel things about the end time. He said, there's going to be, at this time I'm telling you about, which later he says, just seal up that scroll because you're not going to understand it. And nobody's really going to understand it until the end times. But when they read this in the end times, they're going to understand it. We understand it now. (laughs) So that's what he's saying. But he said, there's going to be a time in that time of great distress on the earth that has never been seen before. Jesus even talked about that. He talked about what will happen when the Antichrist reveals himself. Uh, It's recorded in Matthew 24, verse 21. It says, For then there will be a great tribulation. He uses the word, great tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. So Jesus is saying, there's a a time of great tribulation, a time of great trouble coming. It's been, it will be unparalleled. It was never been anything like it before, and there will never be anything like that after. So the tribulation really is about two things, basically. Number one, the tribulation is about God's wrath on those who have rejected him. One of the raps God gets, Christianity gets, is that God's wrathful. He's mad at everybody. He's not. He's not mad at you. God has wrath towards sin. Okay? That wrath was... We saw assuaged. What's the word for assuage? Uh, taken away. The wrath was taken away for your sin when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus took the wrath of God on himself. When Jesus died a violent, horrible, painful death, including all the whipping, when he suffered that, he, he was taking the wrath of God for your sin and my sin on himself. 
the, the big 25 cent religious word that some of your Bible translations have is propitiation, which means the wrath has been satisfied. So God's wrath was satisfied against um, sin on the cross. God's not mad, right? He's for you. So he's, he has no wrath against you. But he does have wrath. And in the last days, because there are nations and groups of people and leaders who not just, they don't just reject God, they're like an enemy of his, who come against everything that is godly. And there are people, there have always been people in the world like that, and they're going to continue to be. And the time of tribulation, one of the things is God is pouring out his wrath on those who have like thumbed their nose at him. Like, don't want anything to do with you. Like, we're fine on our own. On our own. Just leave us alone, God. Get out of here. He's going to pour out his wrath. Um, Colossians 3, 6 says, For it is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. That's not you. You're like, well, sometimes I'm disobedient. Yeah, but the blood of Christ covers that. And, and when you're clothed in, in the righteousness of Christ, God doesn't see all your, all your mistakes. He just sees the righteousness of Christ on you. Basically, in the eyes of God the Father, he sees you as perfect, even though you're not. But that's how he sees you, because his wrath has been satisfied, all right? So you're not, part of, you're not part of this. Revelation 6, this is talking about um, right in the middle of the tribulation. Uh, it's, actually before, it's actually before the Antichrist reveals himself. If you look at the chronology of, of Revelation, uh, Revelation 6, starting verse 15, talks about this tribulation period. It says, And the kings of the earth, these are world leaders who are thumbing their nose at Christ, weren't taken up in the rapture, so the rapture's already happened. We're out of here. The kings of the earth and the eminent people, eminent, not eminent, eminent, they mean important, well, they think they're important people, and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong and every slave and free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's Jesus. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So this is during the tribulation period, and I believe after the rapture, when things are really seriously, and I mean this, going to hell, there are going to be people, world leaders, who had it so good for so long, who thumbed their nose at Jesus Christ, who are going to like, please let me die. <laughs> Take me quick. But they're not going to be able to die. They're going to have to go through it. This is not for you, all right? Make sure you understand that. This is for people who have constantly thumbed their nose at Christ as leaders and have, have influenced a lot of people to do the same thing. <clears throat> By the way, I, I, also, I said that the, the tribulation really has two purposes. And the one we're not going to talk a lot about today. But the second purpose would be he's showing the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, his chosen people who also have rejected him. But he's showing them that he's real and that he cares for them because he's going to protect them through this. And he's going to, uh, the Bible says that the nation of Israel is going to be saved during the tribulation. Doesn't mean every person will be saved, probably necessarily, but most of them will. Um, let's see, we'll talk about this later, but there's two witnesses. Because people say, well, if, if we're gone in the, in the tribulation, or if we're gone in the rapture, how are people gonna get saved? There, well, the Bible tells us. There's two witnesses that come supernaturally on the earth. I believe it's Enoch and Elijah. Why do I believe that? Because they never died. They were both taken up. They didn't die a natural death. They were taken up. The Bible says you, you die once and then the judgment. They never died. So I, I believe God, they've been in heaven waiting. They're going to come back after the, after the, I believe after the rapture and, and at the time of the, when the tribulation begins, and they're going to preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ to Israel. And the Bible says that Israel is just going to get saved by the masses. There's going to be 144,000 basically 
Jewish, young Jewish men missionaries, 12,000 from every tribe who are going to go out and, and be witnesses. And that's how Israel is going to get saved and anybody else in the world. So people say, well, how could, if we're not here because we're raptured up, how's the world going to get saved? That's how, right? Kind of a side note. So we understand the Bible talks about wrath against a certain group of people who've thumbed their nose at God, even countries who've thumbed their nose at God for centuries or even millennia. But now let's read what the Bible says about you. Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, that salvation, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. You're going to be saved from the wrath of God. You're not going to go through that. That's what this says. It's like, well, that's one place. Well, there's lots more. Let me read just a couple more. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Is there wrath coming according to the Bible on this earth? Yes. It's not a trick question. <laughs> there's questions I don't want to answer because it's going to embarrass me. No. Yes. The Bible says there's wrath to come on this earth. It's called the tribulation period. Are you going to be rescued from that? Yes, you are. One more. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 For God has not destined us for wrath. He's talking to believers here. If you're a believer, this is you. For God has not destined you for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of people think salvation is just not going to hell and eventually going to heaven. That's, that's salvation, but salvation is much more than that. Salvation has impact on your life today. God saves you through things today, and that's part of salvation. Sozo is the Greek word there. But he's not destined you for wrath. He's destined you for salvation. And the Bible says he's going to rescue you from the wrath to come. One more. Revelation 3.10. As Revelation, the book of Revelation starts, Jesus said, because he harpazo John to heaven, right? Snatched him up, raptured him to heaven, showed him things to write in the book of Revelation. And, but the first thing he said is, I want you to write seven letters to, seven, to each of these seven churches. Now, these seven churches that John wrote the letters to in, in um, um, well, um, Revelation 2, 3, mostly 3, I think it starts in 2, were churches that actually existed at the time of Jesus, or the time of John, anyway, about 80 AD. But they still exist in, um, in its different forms. Those, uh, not the exact, exact building or location, but the, sort of the, the spirit of that church still exists today. So those letters are applicable to us. And he says this to the church, I, I believe it's Philadelphia. I could be wrong. But he says this, Revelation 3.10. Jesus had John write this in a letter to them. And so by extension, it's believers. Since you have kept my command... To endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Jesus is saying, I'm protecting you. I'm, 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 I'm going to, um, what does he say? I'm going to keep you, it means keep you safe. I'm go you're going to be with me in this hour of trial, this, this tribulation. There's more verses I could share, but uh, because of time, I just want to give you I, what I believe is really, really strong biblical evidence that we as believers will be raptured before the tribulation takes place. I didn't always used to think that, because I used to think, well, we got to be here, we got to be here to help people, and like... Like, God's like, we've been trying to help these people for 4,000 years. They don't want to be helped. I'm paraphrasing. They want to be their own God. They don't want me. Worse, they hate me. But there are people who are going to get saved in the tribulation period. But it's, I'm not the guy to do that. There's these two guys coming, the witnesses... You can read about it in Revelation if you want. It's there. 
and they're first going to save 144,000, and then they're going to go out and they're going to evangelize the world. And anybody who, who's going to get saved during the tribulation can get saved. You don't want to do that because it probably means you're probably going to get killed. If, if you'll be, probably be martyred if you get saved during the tribulation. You don't want to, you don't want to bank on that. You want to go in the rapture, trust me, right? <laughs> you, you don't want to be here for that. But there are going to be lots of people who will be saved during the tribulation period. Another, one more reason why I believe um, that will be taken before the tribulation, or at least early in the tribulation, is that the Bible talks about the Antichrist won't be able to really fully do what he wants to do until the restrainer or this restraining force has been taken out of the world. Let me read that to you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. He's talking about the Antichrist. And you know what is holding him back, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who holds it, the one who holds it, the one who now holds it back, will continue to do so till he's taken out of the way. Who's taken out of the way? The one who holds it back. The Bible says that when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. Your body is a temple. That's why we don't have a temple right now. Because you're the temple, and we make up the temple. I'm a living stone. You're a living stone. We're all living stones built on the cornerstone, who's Jesus Christ, and that's the temple. It's a spiritual temple made up of his people. All right? So, and the Holy Spirit is in us. And because there's, I don't know how many Christians on the earth, I, you know, I'm not the judge, but if there's a billion Christians on the earth, I don't know, what, there's eight billion people on the earth now, something like that. If there's a billion Christians, <laughs> there's, that's a lot of Holy Spirit on the earth in people. Now, I know God's omnipresent. I get that. He always has been. But there's something about his manifest presence in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us. At the rapture, <laughs> that's going to disappear from the face of the earth. Technically, at the second of the rapture, there won't be one person on the earth that has the Holy Spirit in them. Not one. Not one. Now, eventually, as people get saved, they will. But at that moment, there's not going to be one person with the Holy Spirit. And that's when it's just going to get crazy. Because the restrainer has been taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. All right. I hope I've made a case what I think is strong for strong biblical evidence. Number one, the rapture is real. It's to us being taken up to meet the Lord in the air into heaven, which is temporary. We'll talk about that in a minute. So that's real. And I believe that it's going to happen at the, before the tribulation or at least at the very beginning of it. Okay, And if you disagree you're probably still going to heaven. <laughs> That's okay. I tell people, just because you disagree with me doesn't mean you're going to hell. It doesn't mean I'm going either if I disagree with you. I just, you're just based on our belief in Jesus Christ, okay? All right, so let me shift a little bit, but tell you something that I think is really significant here. Most of you have heard the parable that Jesus told about the ten virgins, right? There's, uh, it's a parable to make a point. And the ten virgins, basically, that virgins is like an old English word that means um, brides to be. All right, so they're they're engaged, and they're waiting for the marriage ceremony. And it says they're waiting, and uh, the bride comes at or the groom comes at night to get them, and and not all of them had their lamps ready. They ran out of oil. And so they got dark and they couldn't find, so they, were, they weren't able to go to the marriage, the wedding ceremony. Only a few of them did that were ready. Back in that day, 
the father of the groom, after, he, after the groom proposed to his future bride, the father would begin to build onto their house, either build another little room or a, another little building to house his son and his daughter-in-law to be. The father would build that. And the father would work on that. And when he was ready, the father would go to the son and say, Son, we're ready. And as soon as he said that, the son would go to his bride, to her house, and get her and bring her to the father's house. And they would have a big ceremony that would last for days and they would consummate the marriage. And, and it was an amazing ceremony. And um, That is a picture of what's going to happen in a metaphorical sense with the church. The church is made up of all believers, all true believers of all time. Okay? doesn't matter what you're what the denomination you call yourself, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and you put your faith and trust in him and him alone by the blood he shed on the cross for your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins, then you're a believer and you are in the church. And the church is the bride of Christ. That's what the Bible says. And men, I know you struggle with being a bride. I get that. But I, I, what I've said before is that Women have to be sons, right? Women are sons of God, so men can be brides, right? Anyway, it's, yeah, it's a good thing. When the father would tell the son it's time, it didn't matter if it was noon or six o'clock in the evening or three in the morning. It didn't matter. When he said it's time, the son would go get the bride. Do you remember when Jesus said, I don't know the hour of the day, but, I, but my Father in heaven does. So when Father God tells, tells the son, God the son, it's time, he's coming. All right? So Jesus said this to tell us about this. John 14, starting in verse 2. This is Jesus talking to you. He's talking to all believers. In my Father's house are many rooms. Why? Because he just built them for you. That's why. If it were not so, I would have told you because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I am coming again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you also will be. How cool is that? That's just like the marriage ceremony that went on for centuries that Jesus was talking about in the parable of the ten virgins. Dad's building a house for the groom and his new bride. But when it's done, he tells the son, the son goes, gets the bride, and they come in. The bride's not ready, she doesn't get to go. Be ready. So he's coming for us to take him to us in what the Bible calls, or what we call, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Actually, the Bible calls, calls it the wedding feast of the Lamb. Let me read that to you. Revelation 19, starting in verse 7. This is before Jesus physically comes back to the earth, all right? Because we're reading, in, in this part of Revelation at least, it's chron chronological. Jesus has not come back to earth yet. Antichrist is still on the earth, in fact, at this point, I don't think the Antichrist has revealed himself in the temple yet. No, anyway. But the tribulation is going on during this period in Revelation 19 that I'm just going to read to you right now. Let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, Jesus, because the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus, has come and his bride, the church, has prepared herself. It was given to her the church, us, you, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's you. Then he said to me, write this. 
Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. In heaven, when we're raptured up and those who have died are resurrected, I mean, they're already existing spiritually, but they get real bodies that are eternal. So we all have eternal bodies that are real, that we eat and do our, everything like we do now, it's just, but it's, it's an immortal body, not a mortal body. There's going to be an amazing, amazing banquet party in heaven with Christ and his church. Simultaneously, he's drawing down on earth, he's drawing his chosen people, the Jewish people who rejected him, he's drawing them to himself. And they're getting saved. And there'll be a, there'll be a time for them later. But the church, what he calls the church, which is all the true believers of all time in Jesus Christ, are with him in heaven here. Marriage feast of the Lamb. Again, if you look at it, it's before the physical return of Jesus to this earth. Because that... Because I'm going to read that to you now. So, <laughs> well, let me just back up. When you get raptured, here's what you're looking forward to. Party. With, like, I'm guessing really good food. And a, an amazing place to stay. What's amazing is that place, that, that room that, that the Father has made for you, which I'm sure is just going to be awesome, you're going to be there for seven years, max. Because that's in heaven, and we're with him. So there's this marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding feast. It's uh, also the judgment seat of Christ, which is, not, uh, it was, it, which is a good thing. Rewards about the awesome things you did for Christ on this earth are going to be handed out at that time. I'm not going to talk about that right now. But you're going to be there for seven years, but then we're coming back. Did you know that? Can I read that to you? Revelation 19. So this is after the marriage feast. This is after the rapture. There's a marriage feast. And then this happens. Remember what I just read you, that at the marriage feast, we're dressed in fine linen, white. Bright, white, fine linen. Remember that. Revelation 19, verse 11 we're going down now in time. Going ahead. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. That's Jesus. So John sees Jesus on a white horse. His eyes are a flame of fire. And on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Well, now who's that? That's us. That's us. I hope you're okay with horses. You'll have seven, seven years to learn how to ride. I'm pretty sure they're all dude horses. You know what a dude horse is, right? They just, they're safe. All dude horses go to heaven. Mean horses, maybe not. But seriously, we are coming back with Jesus Christ. He's leading the procession from heaven on a white horse to come back to set up his kingdom here on earth, the millennial kingdom, which we'll talk about another day. <laughs> Everything I'm talking about another day. There's just so much, right? So we come back. Um, so we're, let me just read, reread 14 again. And the army, armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. These are the nations that have rejected him, by the way, and have just gone through tribulation. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, 
King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> Man, I feel, I, feel like, I feel like I'm in the locker room with like the best coach in the world giving us the pep talk, right? I mean, can you imagine like the anticipation of this? Like we're in heaven and it's just been like, like really good food that's, and you're not getting fat probably and, and you can eat, <laughs> right? And, and you're not tired all the time and your back doesn't hurt and you, whatever, I don't know. And, and I just, it's so awesome. And it's like, okay, let's, we're going to go back and I'm going to set up my kingdom. Let's, let's go. Let's ride. Oh, man. Oh. Am I the only one excited about that or no? Okay. <laughs> Oh, man. We'll, we'll talk about this more, but when Jesus, he is coming back and we're with him, and the Bible says he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years, and then the new heavens and the new earth. We'll talk about that in future messages. The point I'm trying to make today <laughs> is that there's a time coming in the future, and I don't know when it is, where all believers are going to be taken to heaven to be with Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It, is, uh, it probably is going to be overwhelming. I don't know. I'm, it's just going to be amazing. And we live in marvelous places that were made by God the Father himself. And we get to enjoy that for some time. And then we come back here and God's going to remodel this earth into an amazing place. And we'll enjoy it for a thousand years and then the new heavens and the new earth. We'll talk about that another day. But here's how I want to close today. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm older, but I get just stinking excited about this. Like, oh, Jesus. Like, today would be a good day. And I'm so excited about, like, coming back with you and, and your kingdom here on this earth. I'm so excited. The Bible says houses will be built and crops will be planted. I mean, there's like meaningful things going on. So construction workers, keep your hammer. You're going to need it. No, you don't use hammers anymore. Keep your nail gun. Shows how old I am, right? Farmers, keep your skills because we're going to need you, right, for food. But there'll be plenty of it and it'll be really good. <laughs> and you won't have to worry about drought. Uh, there might not even have to irrigate, but it just probably happen for you, unless you really want to. But anyway, um, that stuff excites me. But there was a time when it made me fearful. And there might be some of you, maybe more than a few, who this, like, it's a little fearful. Like, actually, this kind of scares me. And I'm not sure I like this too much. Here's where I had to get, and here's what I want, what I want to leave you with today. 1 John 4.18. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, there's no punishment coming your way. None. Jesus took it. Now, if you're not a believer and you don't want to be a believer and you're going to reject God, there is some wrath coming and you don't want to be a part of that. But I'm telling you, for if, you if you're fearful, it's because maybe you really haven't, at a level you need to receive it, receive the Father's love, the love of Christ that drives out fear. Because when you understand the love of the Father and how much he loves you, you understand that, that he's going to protect you. Even mediocre fathers on this earth, of which I, maybe I was mediocre at best, know how to protect their family, your kids, right? Mediocre dads, poor dads might have struggled with that. I get that. Mediocre dads do a pretty good job of protecting their kids. Perfect dads do perfect, a perfect job of protecting their kids. You have a perfect dad 
You have a perfect father and father God. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you. He can't, there's nothing you can do that can make him love you more. Or there's nothing you can do that make you, it can make him love you less. And the Bible says when you receive Jesus, John 1.12, I don't have this on the screen. John 1.12 says to all who received him, to all who accepted him, meaning Jesus, he gave right to become the children of God. And so I've asked this to a lot of groups of people. Is every person a child of God? And most people say, yes, every person's a child of God. You, a lot of you said no because you've been here and you, you, you understand the Bible. No, not everyone is a child of God. Everyone's a creation of God and everyone's loved by God, but to be a child of God, you need to accept Jesus, receive him. That's what the Bible says. God is God to everyone. He's father to the believer. If you're not a believer today, which means doesn't mean you believe he exists. It means you're putting your faith and trust in him. I should probably call it a truster. Are you a truster in Jesus? I'm encouraging you with every fiber of my being today, if you've not done it, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That saves you. That makes you a son and daughter of God the Father. And when you're a a son of God the Father, and he's your dad, he will protect you. Not that every day is going to be easy. It's not that you're not going to have some trials in your life, but you are not going to suffer the wrath of God if you're his kid. You just will not. So I encourage you with every, every ounce in me today, make that decision to trust in Jesus. You say, well, how do I do that? <laughs> You just receive it. The Bible says to all who received, to all who accepted what Jesus has done for you, gave them the right to become children of God. You can't go to church enough to do that. You can't do enough good works to do that. It's receiving, it's accepting. Like, well, that sounds too easy. Yeah, he made it pretty easy. (laughs) Because he didn't want anybody to be left out. So today, as we close, two things. Number one, you need Jesus. (laughs) Number two, if you have Jesus, but you still have some fear, he just wants to do a deeper work of showing you the Father's love so that you don't have fear. Father God, in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I just ask you to fill everyone here to overflowing with your love. Lord, we know that you love us. We're not asking you to love us. We know that. We're asking you to help us see that, to help us feel it, to help us experience the full measure of your love, or at least a fuller measure. I don't think we can really understand the full measure of your love. It's incomprehensible. It's unending. Father, thank you for loving us perfectly. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for saving us. And now, Holy Spirit, I ask that you just pour the love of the Father into everyone here. Let them get a revelation of the Father's great love for them, each and every one of them, that they're accepted, they're loved. Thank you for doing that, Holy Spirit. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.